What you are looking at are the growing conditions for Orchid Ninja Orchid Troy Boy Sun. And in order to keep this video a little bit concise, because we've got a lot of ground to cover, I would like you to be aware that there will be the occasional ticker at the bottom of the screen. Orchid Troy Boy Sun has made his growing conditions available to us so that we can do a little bit of a comparison with the orchids I'm going to feature today. Seeing as I'm in southern Spain and I'm doing something completely different from him, maybe Maybe, possibly, not entirely sure. It just so happens that we are growing the same kind of orchid. But what I'm going to cover are the orchids that you see now. One by one, explain whether I have any difficulties, if I'm going to do anything about it, what I'm going to do about it, if I see any quirks, any observations of the orchids that are featured, and you will see my temperatures, conditions, etc. to the left of your screen, even if I do repeat it in the commentary. So we've got quite a lot of orchids to cover, and let's get started with my Dory Teanopsis Sogo Vivian. She is the good candidate to start with because she is not going to be around for that much longer longer I really messed up with her and what I did wrong with her was take all my frustrations out when it came to losing Phalaenopsis type orchids to scale that were tucked away in the leaf joints and I had been dealing with those issues for many many years prior to even having this channel up and running. So on a warm summer's day back in 2022 I doused her with garlic alcohol my go-to for scale treatment and well she didn't appreciate that very much. The evaporative cooling of the alcohol destroyed the cell structure but I have to add to that I really went to town. I mean, I drowned her in it. I went totally bananas and that was a big mistake. She has never really fully recovered and this is her current status quo. What I'm going to do with her is bin her even though she is showing a new leaf there but everything else is shriveled. There is nothing left for her to grow any roots be it also because she is a slow grower. Anytime you have an orchid that is a very slow grower that is not generous on the root front and you do not have the right temperatures consistently, once that kind of an orchid struggles it is a really hard journey back to recovery. So Sogo Vivian this is probably the last we are going to see of her. My Catlia Cernua, however, I hope to have in the collection for a very, very long time. The plan for 2024 is to get her back on a mount because this potted up version, while it is working, it is not working as I had expected. For two years now, she has been potted up because prior to her being in a pot, I had her mounted and she was doing exceptionally well. However, the mount was starting to become difficult to keep her happy, seeing as I have to miss this orchid a lot during the warm summers. My average humidity is 30% per year, the worst part being during the summer when it gets really dry with warm dry winds. And I was misting, misting, misting. Well, at the end of the day, I thought if this orchid is going to progress, she has to go in a pot. But she is not performing according to what I would like to see. I am uncomfortable with this setup, so she will be mounted. And for that reason, I anticipate her to still be around. She did bloom for us late 2023, early 2024. It is glorious. And in order for that to be a repeat event, we are going to be mounting her. If you have not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. I would so appreciate your support. Follow the journey of all the orchids I'm featuring today because calling it a roller coaster ride of different orchids and their struggles or their progress, that is an understatement. <laughs> so thank you for the support and let's move on to the next orchid I would like to feature on behalf of Orchid Troy Boy Sun. This is one of the divisions of my Dendrobium hibiki. I have two but I'm featuring this one because this one has been struggling with a fungus on the leaves as you can see here which I'm not going to touch I'm going to give you a little indicator arrow so that you will see it that fungus occurred last year coming out of winter and into spring in 2023 because hibiki can tolerate temperatures down to 13 degrees celsius so I took advantage of that I didn't want to keep schlepping pots in and out I believe the too cold air with the extreme high humidity during that time of year 
cause the fungus to perpetuate itself. As you can see with this division, I have not been successful to eradicate it. I use my garlic alcohol sporadically, paint the leaves, etc. But the best course of action I have found is just to get rid of the unsightly leaves entirely in the hopes to then protect the leaves that are still clean. So I've left this single leaf on specifically because it only has a couple of spots. It allows me to monitor if there's any progression on the fungus as well as I need this orchid to photosynthesize because you can see I pretty much stripped it bare before the winter kicked in. I am pleased with the current growth of the new growths. They're not as big as they used to be. It appears she wasn't too pleased with the radical division because I literally chopped her in half. So she is on the road to recovery in my books and I may not allow Hibiki to bloom in 2024. It's going to be a pity because I love those blooms and she blooms for a very long time. But in order for this orchid to maybe recover and grow back to size with canes that should be this long as opposed to this long, I think we're going to let her rest for an entire year and then we can reassess the situation and how she's doing in 2025. By the way, and also if you wouldn't mind giving this video a like, I so appreciate it. This is tailor made for Orchid Ninja, Orchid Troy Boy Sun. And if you want to become an Orchid Ninja, please consider taking advantage of that join button right next to the subscribe button and join the Orchid Ninja gaggle in the background. Thank you. Now that would really help support the orchids as well as myself. So thank you for taking that into consideration. While we look at Catlia Villa, Velotina. Now, Catlia velotina lecca and self-watering because, of course, uh, that is my 80% kind of setup for all my orchids. Something that I've wanted to do because of my super dry climate. However, she can do better. It is a dance trying to keep this orchid happy, trying to keep her roots alive while we are dealing with the winter. What I'm noticing, so far so good. She does dump her older roots. That is normal. That is to be expected. Many cattleyas do that, species cattleyas even more, but I have to be ever so careful to monitor the evaporative cooling of this orchid because she's kind of, you know, sensitive and she is not a generous root grower. So I keep the microfiber just damp. What I do a lot is mist the surface so that the roots are hydrated <laughs> from the top and I do not fill the reservoir just to protect the roots to bring her through the winter. I can see that she is swelling her next growth though. There we go, that eye is coming along nicely. And she, I have noticed, is a scale magnet. Look at that. The anthocyanin, the pock marks and everything, that is from previous scale. She is also mostly a bifoliate, even though the last growth was a unifoliate, but bifoliates in my collection are like little scale magnets and they are also not happy root growers. And they're also very prone to dumping their roots if something doesn't go their way. In a different environment, with the right conditions, with the right humidity, as per Orchid Ninja, Orchid Troy Boy Sun has, I would grow this orchid mounted because she gives me the Brassavola root vibes. Dump old roots and the new roots only kick into action when the orchid is in active growth herself. So after four years, this is what I have to show for. We haven't had her bloom yet, but now I am monitoring her daily for scale as well as adding a little bit of calcium and magnesium to encourage that new growth because we still have another couple of months of volatile low temperatures, sometimes nice temperatures. This orchid is going to make it. Then the next cycle of new roots, she is going to go into lava rock and a self-watering setup. This way I will not be needing to freak out every winter when the temperatures drop and not have to worry about evaporative cooling. The same applies for my Catlia tenuis they are pretty much go hand in hand same care same kind of attention to detail because <laughs> by foliate she's a little bit more generous on the root front but also the evaporative cooling has me a little worried she also likes her scale or how should i say that no let me qualify that scale love her look by foliate <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, she is scale free, but it is a constant monitoring of the little leaf joints, the apex right here. She will also go into lava rock in a self-watering setup once her next new root cycle has started, which is unfortunate because I may need to wait until mid-winter of 24-25. This is her new root growth this time around, but I was hesitant to pull the trigger this season because if you don't have ideal temperatures and you don't have the conditions dialed in, a stressed orchid trying to tide its way through without the adequate light to photosynthesize and produce sugars and energy is going to collapse. And once again, we're dealing with a bifoliate which will dump its roots. I didn't want to risk that. So my gamble here was get another root system growing and then we can just see how she performs for 2024. Her eye is swelling as well. So, this one has also been in my collection for four years, and this is what I have to show for. I would also prefer to grow this orchid mounted. However, my conditions do not allow for that. And my indoor grow space, my winter holding space, is rather limited as well. Alrighty. Orchid Ninja Orchid Troy Boy Sun also has a Prostechia radiata, and here is mine, which was gifted to me by Kateva Orhide. She is doing fabulously. This is the new growth that grew for us back in 2023 and pretty much now she's actively growing her roots. You will see here on the lecker that I have some root tips that didn't make it into the pot. I am not concerned about this orchid and having some root tips fail at the surface of the pot because the lecker has drawn the moisture out of the root tips. This orchid is a prolific root grower, so if I've got 80% of her root system going into the pot, which I have, then the 20% is collateral damage and I'm okay with it. That would not be the case with the cattleyas we just saw. But Prostechia radiata is pretty much on track, doing very well, and I have been watering her throughout the winter. Today, she got a little bit of CalMag because we have some very low temperatures coming up, and I want to prepare her, have her defenses up so that she can cope with those. Even though, Lekka and self-watering once again, evaporative cooling, we're talking about a warm grower here. It's a risk I'm prepared to take, but I have found Prostechias to be so much more temperature tolerant. And for that reason, I do love them a lot. <laughs> they are super helpful. So if you want to indulge me just a moment, I want to see what's bulging under that sheath at the base. <laughs> Lovely jubbly. In your face. <laughs> step back in a moment, I will, I promise, is my Panarica Prismata Carpa. But what I wanted to point out here is, because she's also a warm grower, what I'm going to do is remove that sheath, all of it, even though it's not crispy yet, because low temperatures, these are the little quirks that I have to be mindful of, maybe you do too, but low temperatures and these sheaths can get very wet and they are wonderful, wonderful little areas for a fungus to develop, things to go horribly wrong, a new growth that you can see under the sheath there, that can rot out. Why would we want that to happen? This wasn't wet enough, but at this stage, when the sheath is all black and crispy, it gets harder and harder to pull them off. Whereas at this stage, while they're declining, going yellow, etc. This is a great time to pull them off because that is an easy pull. You're not damaging the plant at all. And this way I can permit some airflow to get in there, which is super important when there's high humidity, and avoid rot on the pseudobulbs because, huh, let's step back for a moment. <laughs> Isn't this amazing? She got repotted into this enormous pot in 2023 because much like the Prostechias, Panaricos are wonderful orchids that are not shy on the root front. And I didn't want to have to do the repot again <laughs> in several years. Well, it would appear that we may be in for a repot in 2025. Maybe I can stretch it to 2026 because my Panarica has responded to the repot like bat out of hell, whatever you want to say, 
instead of having the first, the main lead, grow a new growth, this Prismata Carpa has also developed two new growths on the sides. All of them have a beautiful sheath. Whether all of them will bloom, well, we'll have to wait and see. But if only two of them bloom, I think we're in for <laughs> a treat. Let's not exaggerate. We're in for a treat. <laughs> But this orchid is doing superbly. I do have to bring her in and out every day. She's a super highlight orchid. And because I'm taking her in and out every day, bar the cloudy cold days, being a warm grower, you can see that some of the growths are not coloring up into the dark green that they're supposed to be. It's a little bit wishy-washy here. So this texture is extremely volatile, prone to rot, and that is why I'm very mindful of removing the sheaths around the base, which is something I like to do anyway, because aesthetically they're not pleasing, they can hide pests, etc. But for this Panarica specifically, yeah, because my conditions are not ideal, I am making sure that I don't break the growth in the back, that all the bases here are free of anything that could possibly invite a problem. But she's a beast, she's doing well. <sighs> My back, however, is protesting because this pot is not light. So I'm gonna remove her away because we still have one more to go in this section before we move on to others that are mounted. Okay, Dawiana, this is not your fault. This is my fault. Let's get you centered. Now, Catlia Dawiana has a reputation of being a fussy orchid to grow. I would like to, based on what I have experienced in the past five years with this orchid, I would like to correct that a little bit and be a little bit more specific about what is fussy. What does that mean? Because to grow her, <laughs> look at this. She is growing beautifully. And look at all the viable eyes at the base. That is insane. I'm not expecting all of them to develop, but growing her is a breeze. So, what is it that makes her fussy? Well, my opinion is getting her to bloom. She is blooming size. <laughs> She has been for quite a while. I am in southern Spain. I have a lot of light. However, look at the color of her leaves. They are a dark green, even though she gets a lot of light during the winter as well. Not to the point of sunburn though, because they will burn very, very quickly. I lost a big leaf, was it maybe last year or two years ago, and it had burnt to a crisp. It was one day of 39 degrees Celsius, and boom, I had toasted my Dawiana. So, we know that all orchids need light to bloom. Okay, we've got light. However, this orchid is very fussy when it comes to the strength and the intensity of the light. And that, I think, is the key, the little nugget of what makes this orchid fussy. If you grow Cattleya dawiana and you have bloomed your orchid, please tell me in the comments what kind of light levels you provide. Know that I grow this orchid outdoors for eight months of the year. Right now, she is indoors. Know that as well. Her new growth grows during the optimal time of year, so she gets plenty of bright shade. I never expose her to direct sun anymore. So what the plan is for 2024 is she needs a repot much to my chagrin because she doesn't need it because there's no more space in the pot. This pot, however, is broken and that means that the orchid can slip out of my hand at any given time and I would cause some serious damage if she were to fall. But other than that, she is loving Lekka and self-watering and I am loving her for it. You can see a little bit of scale damage and that usually happens during the winter because yes, I have my orchids, they're pretty close to each other. So unfortunately, you know, we got a little bit of hop, skip and a jump of the pests. But other than that, I've had no issues with Cattleya dawiana with the exception of dialing in the light levels in order to get her to bloom. How are Yara Lava Burst? <laughs> she lives, she thrives, she's loving her life on my little scrubby pad. She is a survivor, she has been rescued. Look at another new growth coming at the base there. 
This will be her second spike in about six months. And she's just living la vida, absolutely digging her little scrubby pad. I am not intending to change anything with this orchid setup. I am surprised she's still with us, but it is nice to actually bring an orchid through that was on the brink of let's say no return and she is just going 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 i do bring her indoors at night even though she can tolerate low temperatures outdoors but in my opinion it is nicer to have her indoors because my indoor night temperatures sometimes can drop to 14 degrees celsius at least she's safe even when indoors she could handle a 10 degree celsius at night but hey i am rescuing her <laughs> even though this will be her second spike I'm not gonna push my luck. I'm so excited to get her back to this point. Another mount, but more in the classic sense, is my Dendrobium Seraula. Woohoo! Look at the progress of this orchid. She is now getting a dose of calcium and magnesium. This would be her second one for the day because it's beautiful and warm. This orchid needs to recover after having been sawn off the mount of a dendrobium, a phyllum mount, which you will see later in this video. But look at her, she's trying to bounce back. And for that reason, calcium and magnesium, uh, much, much needed to help her bounce back. This orchid is a little bit weak. I'm trying to keep her thrips free. And so far the garlic alcohol is doing a wonderful job. Thrips being the nightmare pest for this orchid here. She is a prolific bloomer, but for 2024, the target is to get her to recover, to remain pest free. So far, I have managed to eradicate what was starting to manifest itself under the other leaves. But you can see all this new growth here all this has to be protected. It's a little bit wrinkled in the leaves because there was a massive decline of her original root system. I probably took off 70% in sawing her off the main mount of the ophyllum. And this little growth on the side is at the moment, from what I can tell, the only one that's growing actively roots to sustain the orchid. Anything else that I cannot judge or see is a bonus. I'm going by what I'm seeing right here at the base. But the progress is promising. So my thrips treatment for her because she has very thin leaves, her cuticles are thin, is just before the sun sets when her stomata close. I do not need any evaporative cooling of the garlic alcohol to damage any of the cell structure. So her treatment is extremely targeted and I hope precise enough so that she can grow, develop and get her strength back wonderful little pink blooms that sparkle in the sun with a pixie dust spattering of pink sparkles. Gorgeous. And when she's healthy, when she's got her groove on, she can be in bloom easily four months of the year, if not more. So that's Dendrobium seraula. Now I'm gonna show you images of a Cattleya a Clandier because she is no more. Dingaling here, you know, lecker and self-watering because yes, that is what I do. <laughs> and I thought I would get it right, wrong. If you're growing a Clandier, I have not figured out how to grow her in lecker and self-watering. I believe it can be done. I failed. And it is possible that the evaporative cooling did a number on her as well. Meanwhile, we do have her as a bifoliate again, etc., etc. I have elaborated on that. Anyway, she is no more. Even the attempt to get her just into lava rock when she was growing active new roots, that was a little too late for what she had left in her with her tiny little leaves in order to make it happen. So unfortunately, I do not have a Clandia anymore. If you grow a Clandia and if you have the conditions dialed in, highly recommend that orchid needs to be grown mounted, just for example, like the Cattleya cernua. But seeing as Orchid Ninja Orchid Troy Boy Sun has the Eclandia, I wanted to make mention of the fact of what I did wrong with mine and why she is no more. And then we have Dendrobium Aphyllum. What you're looking at is the class of 2019 Keiki's bursting into active growth. 
meaning they are getting calcium and magnesium first and foremost just to make sure that the little cell structures that are coming will be strong enough to sustain themselves and not die off if temperatures were to drop again before they've hardened off. So calcium and magnesium is a big factor for these orchids this time of year just to ensure their cell structure holds up to the adverse conditions. Meanwhile, a film can live outdoors and mine do live outdoors all year round and do tolerate the temperatures going down to five degrees Celsius. It is glorious. Meanwhile, when you look at these sticks, <laughs> it doesn't look like a pretty sight, but I can assure you that my brain is already seeing a mass of pink blooms on these sticks. So for me, this is gorgeous. <laughs> now, it is a little strange that my little cakeys that aren't as long, large, and as vigorous as the mother plant is, that they're still young ones, it is strange that they're already coming into active growth, whereas there's absolutely no sight of any new growth on the mother plant. I think that's just because there may be a one, two degree temperature differential between the two, the keikis living very close to the building and the mother plant exposed more to the elements when it comes to colder wind at night, I think. I can't make sense of it because the mother plant is getting full direct sun. <laughs> She's facing east and at this point in time she is getting blasted with light whereas the keikis are almost in permanent shade. <laughs> who knows, who cares, but the amount of growths that are coming out of the keikis, oh my goodness. One little keiki cane is showing three? That's insane. So the mother plant better get her act together and let's see if the long canes that she has will also produce at least two growths each, I would say, no? But yeah, this is going to be a beautiful, beautiful spectacle. Seeing as it's February, I am looking at all the nodes. I feel as though I see some uh, busting moves with nubbins, but I think it's also my wishful thinking playing tricks on me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not ready to actually confirm that I've already got nubbins showing. But once the nubbins show, it's still going to take forever for this orchid to bloom out. <laughs> In another comprehensive video, I am going to do a complete update on the Dendrobium aphyllum. I just wanted to show you these two. I still have my curtain project going, but seeing as it sticks on sticks on sticks, I'm just going to make a video just on everything aphyllum sometime in the future. Brassavola perinii. So yeah, I have featured this orchid all these years as Brassavola flagellaris. Well, I think this is a Brassavola perinii, and I'm going to tell you why. Because by comparison, what I think is actually the flagellaris, which I call my zombie rhizome, which miraculously sprang and grew back to life, that one has much longer leaves than the one that I thought was flagellaris. Now, back in the day, I got my collection very, very quickly. The boxes were coming in faster than I could deal with them, and it is possible I switcherooed the tags. But this orchid, if it is the perinii, it does not like being outdoors. But the anthocyanin that you see is not because of cold damage to my understanding. It is because of the way the angle of the sun is hitting the orchid this time of year. Because you can see the rest of the orchid is green. The reason I'm pointing that out is anthocyanin can and will occur as cold stress. So the lowest she has tolerated so far from January to February is a six degree night temperature, maybe three or four of those back to back. But I do cover her with a heavy duty towel every night and hopefully be able to protect her from the cold wind or cold air. This is how I'm trying to get her through the winter because the mount is extremely heavy and the damage I would do to this orchid would be even worse than if she were to suffer a little bit of leaf tip burn because of cold temperatures. But I'm not seeing any cold damage so far. There may be a kink in one leaf, but that is because of the weight of the towel, but no other cell structures that I can see are affected. So I'm hopeful that she's gonna do well. And yes, I am focusing on calcium and magnesium throughout these colder months. And then of course, misting a lot with plain RO water to flush any salts off. She is not dormant, but she is not exactly actively growing fast because the conditions aren't ideal. With ideal conditions, she would be a continuous grower. And I'm doing exactly the same thing with my zombie rhizome, except that that mount is not so hard to bring indoors every night and it is growing beautiful new growth. So they're pretty much in the same phase of growth 
Now, it's just a question for my zombie rhizome to bloom for us so that we can distinguish if they're one and the same orchid, the one is healthier than the other, or if I indeed had switched around the tags. But yeah, I'm going to count this as my Brassavola perinii. I hope you enjoyed the setup of this video and that there was maybe a nugget of intel that you didn't know needed confirmation on or heard for the first time. Either way, I would so appreciate a like and thank you so much Orchid Troy Boy Sun for providing me with the information about your growing conditions that we can do this video together and if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. By the way, this is part one. Part two will be linked in the description once it airs and vice versa. Part one will be linked in the description of part two once part two airs. I hope to see you in part two whenever that may be. In the meantime, let me thank you so much for watching. I would like to wish you a fabulous day on the condition though, please, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.